Good afternoon, NDC. You all having a good time? Excellent. You all learning a lot? Brilliant. Uh, my name is Dylan Beatty. Um, for the next hour, I'm going to be talking to you about something called domain architecture isomorphism. If you don't know what that is yet, you are in the right place. By the end of the hour, everything will be crystal clear. And I am going to prove to you all that we all need to stop having meetings, otherwise the internet is going to stop working. <laughs> Sound good? All right. Um, so I, a bit of background about me. I uh, built my first web page in 1992. Um, I've been building websites and web applications and that kind of thing forever. And over the years, I, um, I have become a systems architect because I'm one of those developers who used to complain about other people's code until eventually they said, fine, if you have strong opinions about everything, then why don't you just go and be in charge of it all? Um, so my current role is systems architecture. I design systems, and I design the way systems fit together. And one of the interesting things that I have discovered over years of doing this is the way that the your team, your organization, the people you work with, and how those people interact has a profound effect on the structures and the design of the systems that you create. Um, so what I generally do is, you know, we come up with an idea for a system, an opportunity, something. I'll draw an architectural diagram, which is rectangles and lines, and everyone will go, oh, yeah, that looks brilliant. And then they'll come to me for the next six months and go, what does this rectangle mean? What does this line mean? Um, so this is my definitive ultimate architecture diagram. So every project I ever do, I'm just going to give them a copy of this at the beginning and wait for people to come and ask, because that's what's going to end up happening anyway. Um, now, when I first started my, my career in development, it was the late 1990s, and I was building basically cookie-cutter websites. Um, worked for a small, small agency. Clients would come to us and go, you know, can you make us a website? And, you know, we're talking this kind of era of the internet. We're talking Netscape Navigator and Doom and Quake were still quite exciting. <coughs> So someone would come in, you know, we'd have a couple of meetings, and we'd just get something out, and we'd get them to sign a contract which literally said that we'd charged them 15 pounds sterling for every hyperlink that we put on their website, because we used to actually, when it very first started, people would add those manually, and you'd charge them by the hyperlink. Um, and even back then, one of the interesting things we noticed, there was a sort of an upper limit on how big a project we could get right. We were, you know, the, the devs I worked with were all graduates. It tended to be one person would do one thing, and anything you could finish within three months would generally work. You'd ship it, the client would be happy, everything would get paid. Anything beyond that kind of three-month sort of planning horizon window would start to get a little bit messy. Now, I did a bunch of things. I probably built 20 or 30 different websites over a couple of years. Um, and one of the clients who I started working with back in those days was these people. Um, now, I, I gather you have something in Australia called Spotlight, which is a very different Spotlight to the Spotlight that exists in the UK, because we've had a couple of people come over and, and join our team. So Spotlight in the UK is a, a 90-year-old startup, basically. It's a um, company that's existed since 1927 that prints and publishes directories of professional actors and actresses. And the, the main, the backbone of our business now is recruitment for actors, you know, actors looking for acting jobs. Everything in the UK and Europe, you know, at the top end, we got stuff like, you know, Star Wars and Lord of the Rings and Doctor Who and Prometheus and all the way down to, you know, Land Rover commercials and corporate role play and training videos. Um, it's a very, very interesting industry to work in because it's a really interesting combination of creativity and show business and technology. Um, and occasionally we've had people come over from, from Australia or New Zealand to work with us for a while, and when they ring their folks back home and say, yeah, I got a great job working at Spotlight, they have to then go in and explain that this is a different thing to the one you have over here. Um, but the interesting thing about them is I've been working with them for a long, long time. And so same problem, same industry, same organization, but lots of different team structures, lots of different ways of working. And so I've sort of had this first-hand experience of seeing the way different teams and different organizations solve different generations of the same problems. And so there's some, some stuff in there we're going to be talking about over the course of the next hour. Um, the other thing I'm going to be talking about is this guy. This is a guy called Melvin Conway. Mel is a proper old-school engineer. Mel studied physics at Caltech, and his physics professor was Richard Feynman who went on to win the Nobel Prize. Um, Mel wrote, has anyone ever heard of MUMPS, the Massachusetts uh, University Hospital Programming System? Mel wrote the definitive book on programming MUMPS. He's been coding and building systems for you know, decades. His first system he programmed had drum memory in it. 
That's how long he's been working in this industry. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Mel in uh, Vilnius last year. He did a keynote at Build Stuff there, and we were chatting about some stuff. Really, really interesting guy. But the specific thing that he did we're talking about today is something called Conway's Law. So this is 1968, and he wrote a paper for Datamation magazine in which he made this observation that organizations who design systems are going to produce designs that copy their communication structures. There's a very sort of pithy paraphrasing thing of this which shows its age, which is if you have three teams working on a compiler, you're going to end up with a three-pass compiler. Now, you know, does anyone in here build compilers? No. <laughs> we build all different stuff nowadays. But the principle and, and the pattern still holds true. Um, now, you know, when say organization that designs systems, we've got some very, very nebulous terms in there. What's an organization? What's a system? What's an anything? Um, for the purpose of today, we're going to define a system as basically anything that has moving parts, anything with components, anything with behavior, data, dependencies, logic, rules. And we're going to look at how those systems get created, and we're going to look at the teams who create those systems. So we're going to start with the absolute worst case scenario, which is a collaborative project created with no organizational structure whatsoever. Um, there's a guy called Rob Ashton, who some of you may have heard of. Um, Rob put his home page on GitHub, and anyone who submits any pull request will get automatically merged and deployed to codeofrob.com. This is Rob's home page. This is a collaborative project with no governance whatsoever. Anyone who wants to can go on and put anything at all on there. This is actually a screenshot of Rob's homepage because every single thing on that page moves. There's CSS animation, there's Flash, there's animated GIFs. And I've actually crashed my laptop before trying to render that, so now I don't show the live page. But we'll do it at the end once we've got all the important stuff out of the way and you can see how, how great this is. So, this is the one extreme. This is what you get if you have people collaborating and you have no communication structure whatsoever. You have anarchy. You have anything goes. It might sound like you know this doesn't really happen, but has anyone ever been working on something where you've stayed late to finish a feature or something and, and you've submitted it and then you get in the next day or come back after the weekend and someone has taken it back out because they didn't like the thing that you did? And you're like, why didn't you talk to me before doing that? You know. Um, and you get these things happening. You know, this is a degenerate example, but you do get in, in open source, in teams, in companies, you get these examples where people just don't talk to one another, and someone does a piece of work, and then someone undoes a piece of work. Or two different people do the same piece of work at the same time. You know? There are how many different ways in the Microsoft.NET framework of combining two path fragments to make a bigger one? And you're thinking that somewhere in Redmond, there's some people who probably should have lunch together once in a while and swap notes on how they're solving this stuff. Because it, you know, it happens. Um, anyway, let's. So this is an organization chart. This is what all, all software companies look like now. So we've got our uh, architecture astronaut who reports to the head of buzzwords, and the head of microservices, and the head of frameworks who report to the CTO. We've got the CEO, the CFO, the C3PO will report to the CEO. So this is you know a classic template of a sort of top-down line of management hierarchy type thing. Um, we then have just another couple of little examples to throw in because I absolutely love these. These are Manu Cornet's organization diagrams. This is Amazon. This is Google. This is Facebook. This is Microsoft. You may have seen this one in Scott Hanselman's keynote this morning. Um, these are a few years out of date now. So this was Apple under Steve Jobs with the, the one guy in the middle telling absolutely everybody what to do. And then the last of these examples is the Oracle's organization diagram, where they have engineering over here, and this is the Oracle legal department. <laughs> OK. I, you know, it's, it's fun. It's, it's satire, and it kind of pokes a bit of fun at everyone's perception of how these, these organizations and things work. Um, so now we're going to look at some very left field examples of organizational structures. So the first thing that we are going to look at, the first organization that we're going to explore is this one.
So that's John Williams conducting the overture from Superman with the London Philharmonic Orchestra. Orchestras are the best waterfall organizations in the world. When a symphony orchestra you know, does a performance or they do a recording, they have a project plan. It is the best, most detailed project plan you will ever see because every note, every movement, every single thing that any of the musicians in that orchestra do has been planned in advance and written down on a score. So they all have their sheet music in front of them. Look at where the lines of sight are. Look at the way people are paying attention. Look at the communication structures that are happening in this picture. So everybody who is involved in creating this performance, everyone working on this team, they have their sheet music in front of them and they are watching the conductor. The conductor is the project manager. They know exactly what they gotta do and they got the guy at the front who is just setting the pace. This is the cadence, this is our sprint cadence. One, two, three, four. Orchestras cannot improvise. Orchestras cannot adapt. They are perfect examples of waterfall organizations. And if you imagine you know, the Sydney Opera House out there across the bay, if that thing's full, you've got however many, a couple of thousand people have paid $100, $200 a ticket to see Mozart's 21st Piano Concerto. If they do anything else, then that project, that recital, is going to be deemed a failure. Because orchestras are waterfall organizations who are very, very good at reproducing consistent results based on a given set of inputs. So now we're going to play another clip. Just to contrast this approach, so this next clip, this is Miles Davis live in Montreux. And I just want you to pay attention as you're watching this. Look at what the musicians are doing and look at what they're paying attention to. You hear the round of applause there? They just responded to change over following a plan. They did an agile thing. And they got the feedback, they got the customer feedback, and they're like, oh, this is interesting, you know. The thing on the plan, actually, let's go off piece here, let's do something different. And the only reason why they can do that is because they have these communication structures. The last thing that any of these people are actually doing is playing. What they are doing is they are watching and they are listening. You know, these are people for whom the, the mechanics of creating a performance are completely second nature. Like, very, very proficient developers, very proficient coders. Actually, coding is really not the thing they are worrying about when they're trying to deliver systems and trying to solve problems. Because you get to a level with coding where the coding part is so easy you can probably do it in your sleep. Working at what you code, what's the next most important thing you could be working on? What's changed since last time you took stock of the things you're working on? And so, Think about the organizations and the teams you work in. Are you working for an orchestra or you're in Miles Davis band? And the worst of all possible worlds is a symphony orchestra where the conductor goes off and he does a three-day agile certificate course. And he comes back in, he gets up there, he picks up the sheet music and goes, we don't need this anymore, we're agile now. And everyone stares at him going, and now what? Because if you have organizations that are trying to be something that they are inherently not, it's not gonna work. You know, you cannot turn a waterfall organization into an agile organization just by saying you are gonna be agile now. This, this person is your scrum master. They're not, you know, they're still an old school waterfall project manager. You cannot become, go from waterfall to agile just by changing one person's job title. Okay, so a couple of fun examples. Let's talk about some real examples. So what I'm gonna do, I wanna talk you through sort of 10 years worth of evolution of the code bases we use at Spotlight the projects we've created, and the way those have changed over time. So when I first started working with them, um, I said I was working in this job shop, we had a whole bunch of clients. 
So using my amazing organizational chart notation, the blue things are stakeholders. Now the first thing we had, Spotlight had a project manager. They had a head of IT. And all the other people, all their customers, all their business stakeholders, they all talked to this guy. And then this guy would ring me up every couple of months. That's me, or one of my coworkers. And he'd say, hey, can you build us a system to do this? And we'd say, yeah, here, build your system. And then they'd go quiet for a couple of months. And then they'd get some more budget, or they'd have a good idea, and they'd ring us up again and go, hey, can you build us a system? And we'd go, yeah, sure. And we'd build them another one. And these are all you know, little self-contained, um, not microservices. These were just small monoliths that didn't talk to each other. You know, every time, the only integration point we had between any of these was a big shared SQL database sat in the back. Um, and this pattern went on for about three years. And at the end of that three-year period, the guy in the middle left. He quit and he moved to Thailand. And they rang me up and said, you know, why don't, why don't you come and work for us? And it sounded quite exciting, so I moved up to London and I, I joined them. And ended up with this structure. And the first thing that I realized was, oh man, some idiot has been building little websites for the last three years and sticking them all over the place. And they, there's no shared code, there's no modules, there's no dependency management. These things are all just sat out there as little isolated islands. Now, the reason why I think that's interesting is because you tend to think of communication structures as being ways that people talk to each other now. The communication structure that was missing here was a plan. We didn't have, because we were being brought in to do six weeks worth of work, and then they'd, you know, we'd finish the work, we'd go back to do something else, and then they'd ring us up again. There was no kind of roadmap. There was no communication structure connecting this piece of work to this piece of work to this piece of work. Because each one of them was done in isolation. And one of the biggest things that started to change when I sort of joined them full time was suddenly there was some continuity to this thing. I was still the only developer working on it because this was when we were small enough that I was doing most of it myself. But the difference between six weeks on and then two months off and six weeks on to going full time is that suddenly there is some, some continuity. There is a communication structure, which you know, was just like a notepad file where I kept a list of ideas and, and stuff. But even then, you can see a distinct change when it goes from these little standalone projects to things that actually look like they're working towards a goal. So this is me. In there, all stakeholders are talking directly to me. For a while, it is an incredibly productive way of working. Someone wants something, they ring me up or email me, and I'm like, yeah, we can do that. And we turn it around and we do it. You know, it's, I basically, in the course of a given week, I do development, I do help desk, I did network stuff. I used to make network cables. It was great. You, know, you got to do absolutely everything. Install operating systems on servers, put the server in the rack, plug it in, ring the ISP, what they call a full stack developer back when it actually meant something. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it, we started doing quite well. You know, we, um, as I said, it's a very old company, and I joined them kind of on the cusp when people were moving away from books and CD-ROM to doing stuff online. And you know, the, the internet's quite popular. A lot of people thought it was a good idea and started using it. And we started growing very, very quickly. And it wasn't very long before they said, oh, you know, let, let's hire another developer. So what they were thinking we were going to get was this. So there'd be myself and one other person, and we'd be talking to each other and exchanging knowledge, and we'd be able to cope with twice as many stakeholders. Uh, what they got was this. So the first thing that happens is they're like, we need to hire another developer so we can move quickly. We get another developer, and everything stops for six weeks, because that's how long it takes to get this person up to speed. And while I'm you know, training them and showing them the ropes and explaining where everything is, I'm not doing any work either. And what starts happening is instead of this you know, lovely structured organizational knowledge sharing thing, people are just hassling whoever they can find. If I'm not at my desk, they'd hassle Dan. If Dan's not at his desk, they'd hassle me. When the phone rings and it's a customer with a bug, one of us would pick the phone up. Whoever picked the phone up would probably end up doing it, end up managing it. And so if you look at the code that was created during this particular period of history, you'll see exactly the stuff I was talking about earlier. You'll see, you know, both of us would have solved the same problem. Like a bug report would come in, and for whatever reason, we wouldn't coordinate that I was working on it and he was working on it. We ended up fixing the same bug twice. Um, this is back when we started off using uh, Beyond Compare to do production deployments. Like literally, you'd take your workstation, you'd take the live machine, and you'd see which files were different. Um, we graduated from that to Subversion. Nowadays, we're on Git, and we've got Octopus and Team City, and everything is much, much shinier. But you know, it's interesting looking back, because you can still see traces when you go and look into the code. 
you can sort of say, ah, so this, this stuff is actually replicated in two places. Because when that logic changes, you need to remember that there's another copy of the logic over there. And it's probably written in a different language. Because this was all classic ASP. So some of it was JScript and some was VB script. Ah, what fun. Anyway, so this is all going along. And um, we make one of the classic mistakes that all companies make. We decide that what we need to do is a big rewrite. Because this is all getting a little bit messy. And we decide that the best thing to do with the rewrite is to adopt something they call a skunk works model, which is where you basically say, right, we're going to have a team over here who deal with all of the kind of day-to-day -day, you know, maintenance and debugging and help desk and everything. And we're going to put some people over here who are completely free to concentrate on the new shiny thing. The thing with skunk works projects is when they work, they're quite famous. The IBM PC was a skunk works project. You know, IBM are building these massive mainframes for businesses. And they realize they need to start something they can sell to small companies, something that will fit on a desk. And there's no way that the big company can do it. So they put a couple of people in a room and say, you know, go and build us a desktop, a personal computer, a PC. Um, Microsoft Xbox was another great example of a Skunk Works project. You know, Microsoft make beige office software. And suddenly someone goes, hey, we need to compete with Nintendo and PlayStation. And Microsoft is, you know, at that point, not capable of competing with that. So they put a bunch of people in an office, and they give them an unlimited credit card and say, Hire whoever you need, do whatever you need, make us a console. Um, the reason we've heard of those ones is because they succeeded. Most Skunk Works projects do not. Now, the big mistake that we made when we tried to do this, the people over here were no longer in the loop when it came to the day-to-day -day bug reports, user feedback, customer interaction. You know, all of the people who were doing real work are over here. And they're talking to this team. And this team are off, you know merrily waltzing off up their ivory tower, completely out of touch with what's actually going on. And because there is no communication between the teams, after a fairly lengthy development cycle, we realize we've built something very clever that we can never launch. And the reason we can't launch it is because this system here is making all of the money. It's got all of the real work going through it. It's controlling all of the revenue. And our system has no interface. There is no communication between the new system and the old system because there was no communication between the team building that one and the team building that one. So any kind of, you know, that sort of skunk works development, the, the two examples I cited, IBM and, and the Xbox, they worked because the Xbox didn't need to talk to anything else that Microsoft did. You know, it's standalone games console. It didn't even have a network capability, the first generation one. No, didn't need to run Office, didn't need to run Windows. It was completely standalone. The skunk works approach can work very well if you genuinely need to effectively create something that otherwise would have been created by a competitor. If you genuinely get an advantage out of having that sort of, you know, that wall between two parts of your business, it can work. But in our case, we learned a lot. We got a library of very useful code snippets that we still go in and pull things out of from time to time. But because of that lack of communication between the two halves of the, the organization, we ended up basically giving up on the rewrite, going back and focusing on, on this thing and enhancing this thing. Um, now, the next pattern that happens is we start looking at Agile and you know, the idea of having a backlog and having a product owner and all this kind of stuff. And the model that we are looking for here, these are all your stakeholders. They feed into a product owner who maintains a backlog. Backlog feeds work into a team. The team is self-organizing. They communicate amongst themselves. This is the textbook example of how this is supposed to work. The difficulty with imposing this model onto an existing organization is that everyone disagrees on who this person should be. Because people who have been working in an organization for a long period of time, they know how it works. They know, understand the industry. They understand the people. They have all sorts of incredibly valuable domain knowledge. And it is very difficult. One of the most difficult things about software is that the people who use it are people, and the people who build it are people. And people are not logical. You know, People are irrational. People have things they like and things they don't like. And they have all of these very, very sort of strange ways of associating value with things. Um, and you know, we found something which I've found in every organization I've talked to. Seniority, you know, someone thinks that because they have the knowledge, they also have the authority to make the decisions. And you know, I've been here a long time, and I knew best. I should be the one deciding what happens here. And so the idea of we went through a phase of saying to these people, well, why don't you own the backlog for a bit, and you can prioritize your own stuff. 
And that didn't really work because being a product owner is not just something you can slap on someone alongside the job that they're already doing. So we tried recruiting people into this role. And again, it didn't work because the, the powers that be were um, understandably reluctant to go, no, we're going to take our hands off and let this new person who doesn't understand our business make all of the important decisions. And so what we actually ended up with was this, which is we nominally have a agile process. But actually, we've got three or four different people fighting over what goes in the backlog. And in some cases, splitting multiple backlogs. Now, the biggest thing, if there is one sort of sound bite you want to take away from this talk today, it is you must have any backlog, any stream of work, anything, you must have a team dedicated to it all the time. If you've got a backlog, have a team to go with it. A backlog without a team is a dumping ground for things that will never happen. And it's very easy to be like, oh, no, we'll have three backlogs. And, and you can have one, and you can have one, and you can have one. And then they say, OK, well, we've got one development team. You know, which backlog are we working from right now? They're like, oh, self-organize. I don't know. Go and work it out. It doesn't work. You know? If someone wants a backlog, they have to come up with budget, or they have to make the case for getting a team to go with it. If they want to prioritize, they want to manage those decisions. You need to take the business case. Why do you want a backlog? You know, what are you doing? Are you going to save money? Are you going to make money? Is this something we have to do because they've changed the law? Why do you think you need to be able to prioritize and coordinate a stream of work independently of everyone else's? And quite often, you'll find they actually have a pretty good case for wanting to do this. And it will make sense to appoint some, get some people, put them on there, right? That's the team. That's the backlog. They're the person prioritizing, making the decisions. Off you go. Now, it's around about this time that I started doing a lot of reading around uh, organizational structures and Conway's law in particular, and also um, reading about domain-driven design and this idea of domain boundaries within systems. And so the model that we started moving towards is something more akin to this, where you've got you know, sort of stakeholders all around feeding in things into various different backlogs. We have one team per backlog. At the top of each backlog, we have a developers and product people. So you know, developers, coders, front end, back end, QA, product ownership. You know, the idea of a team, what Jeff Bezos called a two-pizza team. It's a group of people, small enough you can feed them all on two pizzas. Now, we got a couple of devs who can eat two pizzas by themselves. I'm one of them. I don't think that counts. You know, I think me and two pizzas are an incredibly productive organizational unit, but people disagree. <laughs> Um, but so the idea here is what you want to do is to identify there will be bits of your infrastructure, bits of your code that need to talk to each other a lot. So the people building those, the people should be talking to each other a lot. And you will have bits of your infrastructure that don't really need to talk to each other very much at all. So those are the ones where you can take two teams and put them you know, different ends of the building or on different floors of the building. And the idea is that you define the interfaces between these components of your system. And then you physically and logically move people around to reflect the structure of the system you are trying to build. So you end up with something akin to this. Now, you know, one very, very easy way of doing this is you say, OK, well, this team are sat together. They're all sat around one desk. They talk to each other all the time. They build this system. This team, one desk, they build this system. This is an interface. And this thing here is, say, a weekly meeting where the one team and the other team get together and they say, OK, we need this data out of your system and we need to process the following commands. And so you have a, within the team itself, you have a very organic, loose leaf collaboration structure where things just kind of evolve because you're free to do that. When it comes to defining the interfaces between those systems, you need to be more disciplined in terms of the way you build the system. So you potentially also want to be more disciplined in terms of the way you collaborate. And that approach can work fairly well, because it means that changing stuff within the box is cheap and it's easy. Changing stuff that affects the interface boundary between them is just you in instinctively think of it as being more expensive because you have to call a meeting, because you can't just shout over the table and go, oi, can I change this? And one of the other things we realize is that this sort of this notion of, of interfaces is occurs at lots of different levels. So one of the, the things we do, we basically were looking at decomposing our organization into membership, publishing, and casting. So membership for us is business activity. 
how do we make money? How do we communicate with customers? This is CRM, this is email campaigns, this is membership payments, billing, all that kind of stuff. And then we got these other two pillars. Publishing is about CV data. So one of the key things we got is this huge database of actors, actresses, credits, shows they've been in, productions they've done, how tall are they, you know, can they speak French, can they ride a motorcycle? And then on top of that, we have the communication services. Someone goes on and says, you know, I'm making Star Wars on Ice the Musical. I need someone who looks like Han Solo and can sing a tenor down to be above middle C and can ice skate. And so these are these three systems, and they do compose quite cleanly. And the thing we realized is that if you look at membership from within the membership domain, you have communications, you have billing, you've got SMS reminders, you've got discounts and product catalogs. But the other systems don't care about any of that. All the other systems care about, you log on to Spotlight and you try and do something, and we just want to know, are you allowed to do that today? Are you up to date? Are we chasing you for money, or are you all paid up? And so for the rest of the system, or the rest of you know, the, the company, we can treat membership as a black box with like three inputs and outputs. You know, authenticate, who is this person? They're trying to use this service, are they allowed to do that? And so there is a natural kind of organic boundary between that element of the system and everything else. And it makes sense to try and structure the organization such that there is a organic boundary among the people who are building it, oh, as well as the, the boundary between the systems. At the moment, we are, one of the difficulties we had with this model, so when I first gave this talk, or a variation on this talk a little while ago, this was very new, very exciting, everyone was bought into it. One of the problems that we're finding is it's actually very difficult reorganizing people because you, know, you can't just go, right, you, 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 uh, you're not on the new organizational chart, bye-bye, and someone go out and hire us 17 new product owners. It's not how life works. You know. These are our friends. These are people we enjoy working with. These are people who have really in-depth knowledge of the domain we're working in and the systems we're working on. And it's not that easy to just restructure them to fit arbitrary things. So it's an ongoing process, and it's one that's very interesting. We're learning a lot as we go along. Um, and it's interesting looking at the, do you have a structure that works for the team you want to be in two years, or do you have a structure that works for the people you've got now? Because if you're trying to build a structure that you can grow into, it's going to hurt. Whereas if you build a structure that fits comfortably now, it's going to hurt in two years when you start growing out of it. And you go through phases when you have a structure you're growing into and everything feels very easy, and then you're going to hit a ceiling where suddenly the growth becomes more difficult and you need to restructure, you need to change something. Let's look at another example. So following on from this, one of the things that we, we ended up doing was outsourcing some work. So let's say we're building this. We've got a, you know, very, very familiar, we've got a, a front-end web app here, and we've got an HTTP JSON API layer, which might be RESTful or it might not, I don't really mind. And then we've got a SQL database. You know, very, very simple, straightforward stuff. And the architect has decided that there will be no direct database access from the web to the database. Everything will go through the API. But this is what your team looks like. So you've got your web app team and your SQL team are both based in the UK. They're probably in London. They're in the same room. They're in a basement, and they go drinking together after work. And on the weekends, they play racquetball together. And you have just told these people that they are not allowed to talk to each other's systems. Anything they want, they have to ask the team in Hungary who are building the API layer. How long do you think that's going to last? You're going to get to Monday lunchtime, and someone's going to be like, oh, we need to draw the shopping cart page and the guys in Hungary aren't on Skype right now because they're two hours ahead or two hours behind or something. Can I just get into the database, draw that one page, and we'll fix it later. You know, we'll, we'll put a ticket in their backlog and they'll come back in. By the end of the week, your structure has completely broken down because the people who are trying to deliver the value can do that much more easily by talking to the people on the other side of the room. Imposing that sort of discipline when it runs across the grain of the organic structure of the team you're working in is not going to work. So what about if you did this? What about if, so this is a pattern that works very, very well in at least one scenario. One specific scenario this works very well in is if the people building the website are building it in a different language to the language that you are, I mean a human language, spoken language. If you've got a, a company based in the UK who have everything in their database in English and you need a front-end website in Hungarian, in Magyar, 
why not do this? So wrap your database in an API and then let a team over here deal with taking the data from that API. They can deal with the localization. They can deal with presentation, cultural things, shopping carts, currency localization, local compliance, all these kinds of things. Now, in this structure, it makes quite a lot of sense. So just imagine for one second you take this to the absolute extreme. Say you've got an architect who is absolutely hell-bent on saying there will be no communication at all between the web team and the database team. So he hires a web team who don't speak any English. All they speak is Russian. And then you go and you hire an API designer who speaks English and Russian. And then you make sure that there is no one on your database team who speaks any Russian. So literally the only way these people can even communicate what they need is to go through this intermediate interface layer. So let's look at another example of a system. Say we're building a e-commerce thing. We're going to sell widgets or gadgets or, or some such thing. And we got a little sequence diagram here. So a request comes into our web server. And web server says to the quoting engine, hey, can you give me a price on six widgets? Quoting engine says to the database, hey, what's the widget price list looking like at the moment? Database says, ah, oh, widget's $25. Quoting engine says, yep, here you go. Here's your quote. The web server says, OK, check with stock control. Do we have it? Stock control says, yes, we got six widgets. OK, great. Tell the database we've just sold all these widgets to this person, customer X. Talk to the email relay system. Hey, send customer X a notification saying, congratulations, we've received your order. Email relay says, yep, done, sent, it's fine. Web server says, thank you very much, you know, 200, OK. Got your stuff, it's brilliant. Yeah. Pretty standard, nothing too controversial in any of this. We've all built systems that, that work along these lines. Except we're going to do something special. We are going to lock all of that in an atomic distributed transaction. So when a request comes into the website, first we are going to go write database, dibs, I got you. Don't talk to anyone else. I'm using the database. I'm using the stock control system. I'm using the quoting engine. I am going to exclusively lock all of these resources in case I need their input to be able to process this request. Has anyone ever seen a stupider architecture than this? This is a meeting. This is what happens when you organize a meeting, <laughs> is you take half a dozen people, all of whom are potentially autonomous agents who can do useful work, and you put them in a room, and you say, none of you are working on anything else. We are locking you out for two hours in case we need you for anything during the course of this transaction. The world is absolutely full of people who are like, oh, we build asynchronous distributed information systems based on microservices. And you're like, OK, cool, how do you do it? And they say, oh, well, we have an office in Shoreditch, and everyone's in at 9 o'clock in the morning. And, and you know, we, all, we have to talk face to face to build our asynchronous distributed systems. Because otherwise, how do you get anything done? And it's very interesting looking at the organizations who seriously embrace this idea that if you are going to build asynchronous distributed software, you have to have asynchronous distributed people. Um, so uh, one interesting example who blogged about this publicly is uh, WordPress. So WordPress don't have an interview process, and WordPress don't have an office. And WordPress have never spoken to most of their own employees on the phone or face to face because they do all of their collaboration through chat and issue trackers and pull requests and code. And so the interview process to work for them is they give you an issue and say, hey, you know, we'll, we'll collaborate with you and we'll work through this and get this done. And it's a kind of asynchronous. The idea is that you work with them for a while before you quit what you're doing at the moment. And the way they interview and the way they work is completely entirely based on this idea of asynchronous components or asynchronous processes. You think about building a high availability system where you have independent worker nodes in some kind of cluster, and you want those nodes to be able to do their jobs without having hard real-time dependencies on the availability of other systems. So why don't you treat the people with the same, you know, the, the same idea? It's like, actually, we, you have a certain capacity to do a certain amount of work. You can do it when you have availability, and we'll make sure that when that point comes, all of the information necessary to do that piece of work is available to you. And it's a real paradigm shift way of thinking away from people in an office having meetings face to face. So take this model here. 
and imagine that instead of being everyone around a room with an atomic transaction lock over them for two, two and a half hours, we're going to turn them into a series of distributed components, and we're going to allow them to communicate using queues. And all the information that you need gets put on a queue. And when somebody has availability, they pull the next thing off the queue. They do that piece of work. They put the results onto another queue. It's a pattern that makes lots and lots of sense to people who've built distributed systems that work this way. But trying to persuade someone to structure a team using the same principle is much, much more difficult. But you heard of the idea of the chaos monkey. It's a thing Netflix have that goes around killing bits of their infrastructure. And the chaos gorilla and the chaos Kong and these, this idea of building highly distributed, highly resilient systems where you are frequently testing what will happen if one bit of it fails. This is the chaos bus. <laughs> and this is, this is actually the chaos bus. Um, what about if you, one morning, you emailed your team, or you went into work, or you know, whatever it is, however you do it, and you say, um, you know, um, Karen is not in for two weeks. She's not sick. She's not in any trouble or anything. We've just decided that we need to test the resiliency of our team to losing one of its key components for a period of time. So we've given Karen two weeks off, all expenses paid, and we've taken away her iPhone. You can't talk to her. Anything that was in her head, you've lost it. Any long-running processes that she was involved in, you're going to have to throw them away and start them again from scratch. There are actually companies that do this. There are finance companies. One of the things they've realized through you know, um, things like the Enron fraud and Sarbanes-Oxley and stuff is people who are involved in corporate fraud don't take holiday because it's very, very difficult to just keep skimming a couple of dollars a day off the books if you're not physically there. And so they enforce holiday, and they can enforce it at zero notice. They will march into someone's office, and they will say, you've got the rest of the week off. Go. You know, no email. You're not allowed to come into the office. Go to Hawaii. All expenses paid. Do something. You're not allowed to be here for the rest of the week because we are required by our you know, compliance issues to give you holiday at zero notice. What if you did the same thing with your teams? You know, pick people who are part of the organization and say to them, right, you, come on, off you go. You've got to go to Hawaii for a week because we need to test the resiliency of our team structure. I like the sound of that. You know? um, and it's another way of thinking things we take for granted when it comes to system design. Don't have single points of failure. Make sure you have redundancy. Have you know, business continuity. Have contingency plans. And then you're like, who's running our contingency plan? Oh, Jeff. What happens if something happens to Jeff? Ah, we hadn't thought of that. You know, Jeff's the backups guy. It's like, well, what if we need to, how do we back up Jeff? So we're going to wrap up by just looking at three. We talked about Conway's law at length. I want to introduce two other eponymous laws. This is Wikipedia page of eponymous laws, which is brilliant. It's got like 500 different laws that are all named after people like Newton's law and Zipf's law. And um, any Battlestar Galactica fans in? Yeah, there's a thing in there. Adama's law, if it can kill you, don't plug it into the network. That's a good law. That's a very good law to live by. Um, but there's these, these, these three laws. So this is Gordon Moore. Gordon Moore uh, ran Intel. He was the head engineer at Intel for years and years and years. Um, Moore's law is you know, pop culture. Everyone knows it. He basically said, the number of transistors we can fit on a single chip of silicon doubles for the same price every 18 months. This has become more generally known as Moore's law of cost gravity. Whatever we do with computers, every 18 months, two years, they're going to get twice as fast twice as powerful, storage is going to get twice as cheap, bandwidth is going to get twice as big. The power, the computing power of the systems and the infrastructure that we are targeting is just getting faster and faster and faster and better and better and better. Um, I hear they're even going to run a fifth cable to Australia sometime soon. You know? <laughs> Think about that. It means the chances of one of them getting taken out by a Thai fishing trawler are like 20% instead of 25. Um, but the law of cost gravity is, is amazing because the, uh, there's a, a great quote who I can't remember who said it. I'll, I'll credit him on Twitter later. The single most astonishing achievement of the software engineering industry is to completely negate the advances of the hardware engineering industry. You know, we've gone from my first computer ran at four megahertz. Now we've got you know quad core gigahertz machines, but you still spend the same amount of time every day waiting for the computer to do stuff because our expectations of what they're capable of are always 
a level, level or two ahead of what the machines we can get now can do. Because systems are getting more and more and more complex because we have higher and higher expectations of what they should be able to do for us. And that's not gonna change. The machines are gonna keep getting faster. Well, actually what's gonna happen now is they're gonna start getting more and more parallel because they're hitting a point where the fabrication process for silicon chips, for semiconductors, is putting out channels so, like effectively wires that are so thin that the quantum behavior of electrons starts getting in the way because you don't have enough electrons flowing anymore for them to give you a statistically significant output at the other end. So the chips aren't gonna get faster, but we're gonna get more of them. We're gonna get quad core, eight core, 16 core. So the future of cost gravity is all about parallelism. This guy is Gene Amdahl, who uh, was a scientist who worked for IBM for a lot of years. He created a thing called Amdahl's Law. Anyone come across this? You wanna share with the room what Amdahl's Law tells us? <laughs> so what Amdahl's Law basically says, there is an upper limit on if you have a piece of work that can't be broken down, there's a limit on how parallel you can get. So let's, let's take an example. We're gonna, gonna throw a big party tonight. It's NDC, we're gonna have a big party and we want, we're gonna make up a little goodie bag for everybody and we're gonna have a cake. And so we gotta make up, there's what, about 500 people here? So we need 500 goodie bags and we need the cake. And the cake is in Melbourne, so someone's gonna need to drive down, pick it up and come back. And how far is Melbourne from here driving? How far? 10 hours. 10 hours. So 10 hours there, 10 hours back? Yeah, okay, cool. So we've got a piece of work that's gonna take somebody 20 hours. Call it 24 hours, we'll give them four hours to you know, get gas and pick up the cake and all this kind of stuff. Now let's say it takes someone five minutes to make a party bag. We gotta make 500 of those. So um, you, sir, we're gonna volunteer you to do all of this by yourself. So you gotta make 500 bags of five minutes each, and then you got a 24 hour round trip to Melbourne. So 500 times five, who's got a calculator on them? 10 days, give or take, about 2,500 hours. So it's gonna take us 11 days. There's no way we're gonna be able to have that, that party. Now, okay, let's bump it. Let's say we're gonna do it tomorrow. So take you 11 days on your own. So let's get some help. You, sir, can, can help out. So you're gonna make some party bags while you're doing this. So you go off to Melbourne, come back after 24 hours. After 24 hours, you'll have made 100 party bags. There's 400 left to do. So both of you then sit down together. By the end of the day, you've done 100 each, and you go, so it's now gonna take you three days. What if we got everyone at NDC to make their own party bag? So one person can make a party bag in five minutes. We need 500 of them. We got 500 people here. <laughs> Let's assume that we've got lots of distributed queues for access to the swag, you know. Um, if we get everyone to make their own party bag, how soon can we have the party? 24 hours, because we gotta get the cake from Melbourne, and there's no way of making that thing go faster. So there is a point at which if we get, say, 10 people making party bags, they'll have finished the bags by the time the cake gets back. Adding more people will not get us the result any quicker. There is an upper limit on how much we can parallelize that process, because we have this piece of work that's involved that cannot be broken down, cannot be distributed, cannot be parallelized. So these units of work that can't be parallelized place an upper limit on how efficient things can get. Cost gravity is making systems more and more powerful. The only way to ensure that the, the work that needs to be done, you know, the, the processes and the, the software we create can take advantage of that is to eliminate these big chunks of non-parallelizable blocking work. And as we have seen over the course of the last hour, Mr. Conway's observation is that your organizations are gonna influence the structure of the systems that you're building. So if we can't afford to have any non-parallelizable blocking work in our code, the only way to do that is to eliminate all of the non-parallelizable blocking things from our teams and our communication structures. So we need to get rid of all the meetings because if we don't stop having meetings, we're gonna hit a point where the internet stops working because we no longer have teams who are capable of creating distributed systems that can take advantage of the astonishing advances in infrastructure and computing power. So there you go. You want the internet to keep working? We've all gotta stop having meetings. Any questions? Yes? Why not send everybody to Melbourne? Then you have a party in half a day at a ridiculous cost. <laughs> <laughs> that would be batch processing. <laughs> Yeah, we'll get a bus, 
We need a bus that, that takes 500 people. <laughs> so actually, there is the interesting stuff in user interface design of giving the illusion of progress when it's not actually happening yet. So we, we could do that. You know, if we have a couple of people start partying right now, it'll look like the party started, even though we're not going to get the cake till tomorrow. It's just then we're going to need to party for 27 straight hours. <laughs> Otherwise, the cake is going to arrive when the party's finished, and we're going to have a, you know, sort of. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? What was the song in the video at the beginning? Uh, the song is Go by the band Public Service Broadcasting, who are an outfit out of the UK who they take snippets of radio and um, you know, public information films and that kind of stuff, and they put them to music. And they just did an album called The Race for Space, which is all radio chatter from the Apollo and Gemini moon landing missions. And it's brilliant. It's the best weird avant-garde album for years. I'll stick a link to it on Twitter. You can find it later. Yes? Can you mention uh, your track listing? Yeah. Do you see any, uh, how are you, because you have staff like you, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I could argue that they're almost the same. Do you see any differences with respect to? So I think the biggest distinction between um, and stealth IT, you're talking about you know, people going off and solving their own problems using Hillary Clinton's email server, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I think the difference between Skunk Works and just people going off and doing their own thing is whether it's actually been sanctioned by on high. Um, you know, Skunk Works has to be like officially recognized. There has to be, yeah. Skunk Works, they'll say, we, we need to decouple you from the organizational restrictions which are impeding our ability to innovate in this area. So, I mean, the Xbox team, they literally, they had an Amex black card with no limit. They rented them an office which wasn't part of the core Microsoft campus, and they said, you know, money is no object. Go out and fix this. You know, make it happen. Whereas a lot of shadow IT is people going, ah, oh, you know, I can't get budget to do this properly, or I asked IT to, to deliver something, and they said it's going to take six months. So I went and built my own using VBA and Microsoft Excel, which is what actually runs 89% of the world's business processes. So any other questions? Yes? Yes. Do you see a role for them continuing or can that also be replaced? I think it's, there are meetings I think that are very valuable and I think there is a lot of creative collaboration. Um, I do not think most organizations are doing creative collaboration when they have meetings. I think they are doing governance and they are doing consultancy and they are falling back on meetings as a apparently very easy way of sharing information where, you know, it's easier to hold a meeting than to actually sit down and write something on the wiki where people can go and read it. And so someone's like, oh, we'll just have a meeting or we'll have a conference call or we'll, we'll, we'll get everyone on Skype or something. Um, the discipline involved in really maintaining the knowledge and the availability and the um, transparency to do things asynchronously is hard. You know, I mean, there are, there are counterexamples in both cases. I think there are probably examples of meetings that are incredibly valuable. And there are probably also very good creative collaborations which don't involve people sat in a room face to face thrashing things out. Um, there's people doing all kinds of, you've seen Trello, the, the sort of Fog Creek thing, where they basically said, well, let's take an issue tracker and remove all the bits that make it specific to software. Let's just make a board where people can put cards on it and move them around. And I've seen people do brilliant creative stuff with you know, music and interior design and stuff using Trello as a coordination tool and you know, never getting down to the point of having to have face-to-face -face meetings with everyone in a room together. So yeah, you know, I think there are going to be people for whom that's the most productive way of working. But I, I would like to get to a point where if you're a person who actually benefits from meetings, the option's open to you, but it's not understood to be a necessary part of work because everyone understands that there are actually lots of different ways of doing this. Does that answer the question? Yeah. yeah. Anyone else? Marvelous. Ah, one more. It seems to be a bit of a contradiction around um, you have a small team which is able to get stuff done. Yeah. We talked about the two groups of teams. Yeah. Um, versus the idea of being able to make individual cases. So when you've got a small team and you take out a significant player in that team, yeah. 
So the question is, is there a contradiction between the idea of having small focused teams and the idea of sort of you know, asynchronous working patterns and stuff? Um, and yet, you know, losing a person is, is disruptive. Losing anything is disruptive. Um, and if you don't want it to be disruptive, you think about the way you manage uh, you know, something like the Chaos Monkey, you manage it in infrastructure systems. It is much more expensive and difficult to run a system with a Chaos Monkey in it than to run one without. Because if you run one without, you cross your fingers, which is free, and it doesn't cost you anything until you have a problem. Whereas if you're engineering in that resilience from day one, you are already, effectively every day, you are paying for what would have been your worst case scenario in the cross your fingers and hope it never happens scenario. But it means that you know exactly what's gonna happen when that, that strikes. Um, so you know, I think take a similar approach with teams. If you understand the dependency and understand the, the risk and the solutions that are available, and if you do need to build teams that are resilient to one or more people becoming unavailable. You know, open source has some really interesting models. Open source has worked incredibly well for a lot of years. Yeah, but there's just this kind of, when you turn around to, to people and you try and sell them the idea of paying people to work using a model that's worked in open source, it's like their brains shut down. It's like, but if they're not there, I can't see that they're working. And it's like, why don't you measure value throughput instead of the number of hours a day someone is on the premises, you know? Um, but yeah, you're right. In all these things, trying to be resilient is going to cost you more than not being resilient until something bad happens. And we can't control when the bad thing happens. Um, but you know, I, I think you're probably right to some extent. You have an asynchronous team, and then one day you realize that a one member of your team hasn't actually committed anything for a week. And you're like, does anyone know what happened? Is, is she on holiday? Is she what? And, um, and then you find out, oh, now they just got bored, or they got another job, or whatever, internet went down, a phishing trawler went through the cable or something. Um, yeah, there's contradictions in, in lots of this stuff. And the point, I think, is about being able to understand why the contradictions arise and make an informed decision as to how to address it in your particular scenario. So, and that is four o'clock on the nose. Thank you very much. Um, this is me. If you want to follow up on anything, I'm here for the rest of the week. Um, I will be hanging around underneath this, this big hat, so come and find me if you want to ask any more questions. Uh, grab me on Twitter. That's me there. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much.